Hello, everybody. It was wonderful seeing the children this morning. And as I've been coming to Bering, back to Bering, I've noticed that there's a lot more children here. And they come up here and they're spontaneous and usually they're giggling and laughing or whatever. And I look at them and I think, oh, wow, they're a part of the joy of Bering. Joy is breaking out at Bering and those children are part of us. We hold them in our hearts and minds and they are part of us. Amen. Uh, also, yes, uh, uh, last night I turned on my favorite uh, news program, National News Cable, and I'm there and they're, ta uh, they're talking about the Uvalde disaster, and then they zoom in on the NRA convention in Houston, and they pan out to the protesters outside the convention center, and there is Reverend Bodie. And Reverend Bodie is standing out there with his uh, black shirt on and his clerical collar representing Bering, right? And he's got the most pleasant look on his face. He's not, he's not ranting or, I don't know what he did earlier or later, but that moment he was peaceful and calm and just standing there as a presence in support. Amen. We're proud of uh, Reverend Bodie. So I guess you've been hearing a lot, you've noticed all the dissension and disunity in our world these days. Sometimes it feels like there's been this infection of psychosis that's just taken over the world. And like people are living in different universes, right? And right now with the, uh, the shooting in Uvalde, you see online a lot of thoughts and prayers and other people saying, no. No more thoughts and prayers, just act, right? Okay, different divides and different perspectives on what that means. So uh, while I was preparing for this sermon, usually half of my sermon builds up about the brokenness of our world and society and, um, and the brokenness that existed in the gospel story if I'm preaching the gospel. And then the second half is about grace. But I think that we've had a lot of stories that we've been attuned to all week that tell us about the brokenness of our society. So I don't want to dwell so much on that. So you might just get about half of my sermon today. Okay? Um, a friend of mine from California, she sent me this uh, picture this week. And the photograph is of Salvador Dali's uh, ascension. Now, Salvador Dali was this surrealistic artist, right? And he painted this painting of the ascension, the rising of Christ up into the heavens. And it's from the perspectives of the disciples. And the disciples are looking up. And the first thing you see are the soles of Jesus' feet. And they are covered in dirt and dust and mire and grime from all the walking he did with his disciples. Jesus didn't just sit and think and pray. Jesus took action. Most of his time was on the road with these dear friends for over three years. Helping, working, doing, acting. But today, our scripture passage in John 17, 20 through 26, is about Jesus praying. It's more than that, though. It's the longest prayer. It's part of the longest prayer that is recorded in Jesus' life. And it's very deep. And it contains something for us that goes way beyond thoughts and prayers. Okay? Okay. Let us pray for a moment. Dear Holy God, thank you for being with us and binding us together and keeping us in your heart and your will. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, and I ask that the Holy Spirit be with us today in both interceding for us, giving us power, and giving us comfort. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, this prayer takes place after the upper room where Jesus had washed the disciples' feet. And it was nighttime. And apparently, because of information later, it was cold. And Jesus and the disciples stepped out of the upper room into that cold, dark night, and they were walking. And as they walked towards the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus started praying. And this part of the prayer, Jesus is praying for unity. But it's not the kind of unity that the world usually expects. It's not the Tower of Babel type of unity, where everybody is the same, they speak the same language, they look the same, everything is same. And I'm, so, there's, so, it's prayer for unity specifically for his disciples, and the amazing thing about this prayer is that Jesus is always also praying for us here at Bering. Because he says, all those that come to believe. So Jesus is praying for us as he's walking through the night. At this point, I normally go into all the turmoil and disunity that existed at that time. You know that in Jerusalem, there were all kinds of religious sects. Judaism was not one thing. There were Essenes, there were Pharisees, there were Sadducees. There were, uh, and every now and then you might have a Samaritan that sneaks in there. Samaritans were half, were multi-bred, multi, uh, half-breeds. I'm not sure if that's a good term. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And not only that, but they were heretics to the Jews, and they believed the Jews were heretics. You know, what a division. And you probably know about that same night that Pilate was there, Uh, in his room, maybe his office. It was maybe late at night, but he might have been pacing around because he was there to enforce Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, through authoritarianism, right? If it took cruelty, he would do it to keep people united. And that was the wrong kind of unity. And then you have Caiaphas. Late at night, he had probably already taken off of his, his beautiful long robes and his miter and put it on the table next to him because it had been a long day of sacrifices sacrifices of uh, animals and burning the animals to appease an angry god an authoritarian type of god that people always wondered did I do something that I didn't even know was wrong? If they got sick, they wondered, oh, what did I do wrong? Why did I do? If a disaster happened, oh, it must be because some group or somebody offended God. Does that kind of sound familiar a little bit? So you have all these authoritarians And Jesus comes with this prayer and paints a different image of God. So, today, as we mentioned earlier, there's all these divisions, even churches break up. There's all these attempts to reunify because, after all, we're social creatures and we like to be around other people. So you have these people around big tables that come together and say, how can we unite people? Oh, let's add something to the book of discipline. Let's take something away from the book of discipline. Let's have a list of fundamentals that everybody can sign on to, and we can all be the same. Okay? Jesus is walking at night with this diverse group of disciples. Judas had already left out into the night to betray Jesus. I imagine Peter walking right next to Jesus. Because, after all, Peter was almost always next to Jesus. And the sword may be glinting in the night in his belt. And then I imagine Matthew and Simon, also disciples. Matthew was a tax collector. He worked for the hated Roman government. 
And Simon was a zealot, a rebel, an insurrectionist, wanted to take action against the Roman government. And I imagine at one time they would have hated each other. Really? But there they were walking together with Jesus. They were walking. Those, clean, those feet that Jesus had just cleaned were getting dirty on the road. And they, Jesus was set forward towards her, his destination. Right? It was an active prayer. So let me get into that prayer a little bit with you. Because it's not only for the disciples at that time. Jesus says he's praying for you. The first part of the prayer is, may they be one as you, God, are one with me and I'm with you. It's almost like we're being invited into this trinity, this so close oneness. To me, it's almost like Jesus is saying, Peter, the disciples, whatever happens, you are part of me. You are in my heart. I will never let you go. If the ground trembles, if things fall apart, if the world is divided, you are mine and I'm not going to let you go. We are one now. Do you ever love somebody that you know, wherever they go in the world, whatever happens to them, they're going to be a part of you. And you're going to be a part of them. And Jesus is praying that prayer. And Jesus prays that prayer for us. Okay. The second part of the prayer, Jesus talks about glory. He says, God... I have been trying to, I have been working to glorify you. And you have glorified me. And I am glorifying these disciples and followers. In the Bible, the word is doxa, which means reputation. It means the way people look at you. It means your exaltation. Jesus is saying, wait a minute, this is who God is. This is who God is. He's not an authoritarian God that you have to be afraid of all the time, that you have to reject and not deal with because you're frightened. That, that authoritarian God is like the authoritarian father that you never know what you're going to do next to incur their wrath, right? Jesus is saying, that's not the God I'm portraying for y'all. And then Jesus' reputation being lifted up, having people appreciate what Jesus did. And he says, that's for the disciples too. And that's for you. As you lift God up, you are lifted up. Okay? And then the final part of the prayer, and this is all connected. The final part of the prayer as they're walking along is that they be united in love. Love. And that wraps it up. Love. And so I'm picturing, what does that look like here? What does that look like? And I'm thinking about something that goes beyond greeting somebody at the door with a smile on your face and saying, you're welcome. That's the start. That tells somebody you're safe. It goes beyond telling your story. And we have excellent places here for you to tell your story. And it's awesome. Right? It goes beyond opinions. Oh, the minefield of opinions. You see on Facebook and Twitter and just maybe your families, 
there are people who haven't talked to their families in maybe years because of political opinions and religious opinions. They're opinions. But we can't seem to get past it. But this kind of love navigates that. It says, okay, you're in the church committee and you disagree with me, but I love you. I'm not going to leave the church. I'm going to keep coming here because I love you. I put you in my heart and I'm not going to let you go. Beyond that, you've got to get through that. If you don't get through that, then you go back up to, hi, how are you doing? The Astros did great this week. Okay. <laughs> the, next, the next step is to share your fears, your hopes, and your dreams. Uh, some of you know Jay Nelson. Remember Jay Nelson? Y'all aren't going to remember him, but I remember him because he came down with AIDS and he uh, wanted our church to start a spiritual support group and because we had people that we loved that were coming down with AIDS and dying and it was a desperate situation, we came together and started this whole wonderful program, unique in the entire city. Bering did that. Actually, God did that. Okay, Hopes and dreams. There was someone here who recently passed away just a few years ago. He had this great vision of this big, huge sign on the corner of Mulberry and Westheimer that said, Bearing uh, Memorial Church, all are welcome here. We don't have to be all the same. We can be diverse and be one in love. And then, then you get to the point where you're working with other people on mission. You figure out what their mission in life is and you encourage them and you help them and you lift them up. So, back to the gospel. Jesus is walking at night in a cold night. I imagine there's tears in Peter's eyes because Jesus had just told him before the prayer, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And when they get to the Garden of Gethsemane that very night before the cock crows, Peter denies Jesus three times while he's huddled around a warm, comfortable fire protecting himself from the cold night. And why did Peter do that? Because he's a human being. He loves life. He loves life. And you know what? Jesus didn't let him go. Jesus didn't let any of us go. And the promises he made took place because the Pentecost came. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. The disciples went everywhere throughout the world, but they were still one. They were still one in Jesus Christ, and Christ was in them. So, I put a lot of things out there. The final thing I want to say is, this is a prayer. This is not asking you to do anything. This is telling you what God is doing. This is telling you that, yes, you're going to try these different ways of being united, and you're going to fail. I'm going to fail. I'm not going to live up to this by myself. And But as you're walking along, God is walking with you. God is telling you, I've got you. God is telling you that I'm going to lift you up, bearing church. 
I'm going to lift you up, each person here. I'm going to love you forever. And you know what? That love I give you will draw all people to me. What kind of church do you want to go to? Do you want a church that's pure and ensures that everybody in it is pure? Do you want a church that's run by an authoritarian organization that tells you that if you don't obey a rule, you're out of there? Are you going to go to a church that is strict to the fundamentals of the faith and make sure that everybody that comes in signs on? Or are you going to go to a church where God is lifted up that has been glorified all because of love? I stayed in this church because of love, because I felt like God had me here. God has you. We have each other. This week, let us participate in something together. Let us do more than thoughts and prayers. Let's pray while we're walking and doing and making a difference in this world because God gives us the power to do it, and it's God. Amen.